Hey everyone, my name is Stephen Slaughter, and thanks for tuning in to the USGS Landslide Hazard Seminar. This meeting is hosted by the Landslide Hazards Program and co-organized by contributions from my colleagues Matt Thomas and Jamie Koselnick. For those of you who are new to the meeting, you have the ability to submit questions via the chat window or use the raise your hand feature in combination with the microphone and video camera. We typically wait until the end of the presentation to take questions. Uh, during the presentation, please make sure your microphone is muted and um, when you're not intending to speak. Today is another installment of a mini series where we hear from state surveys. These talks provide an overview of the state survey landslide expertise, focus areas, product types, and introduce the most pressing landslide related problems that the state faces. If you'd like to have your state landslides work highlighted as part of this series, please contact one of the organizers. So today we're joined by Zach Lifton of the Idaho Geologic Survey. Zach, who grew up in Moscow, Idaho, is a hazard geologist with the Idaho Survey and has been there since 2017. Before that, he spent four years as a consultant in Seattle, Washington, focusing on landslides and seismic hazards along natural gas pipelines. Zach earned his PhD from Georgia Tech, a master's from Idaho State, and a bachelor's from Oberlin College. Welcome, Zach. The virtual stage is yours. All right, thanks so much, Stephen. Um, thanks uh, for inviting me. I'm really excited to talk to you guys. Uh, I see a lot of uh, familiar names in the in the participant list, so uh, good to see all of them, and <clears throat> hopefully um, they're interested in uh, hearing <laughs> what I've been working on. Um, so, uh, so I wanted to chat about landslides in Idaho. It's kind of an overview talk. Uh, in a way, it's uh, a show and tell. Um, you know, as I was putting this together initially, I thought, you know, it might be hard to fill an hour on on landslides. But as I compiled slides, I ended up with a lot, <laughs> and uh, and it turns out there's a lot of really interesting landslides in Idaho. Uh, so um, let's go ahead and jump in. Um, this cover slide, um, I'll come back to this uh, particular landslide later in the talk. But uh, this is a, a photo I took recently with our drone, and uh, it's just such a such a great photo of a really cool landslide. Um, this one is uh, north of Boise near the town of Horseshoe Bend and uh, that just behind it is Highway 55 um, which is one of the one of the main uh, north-south routes in Idaho. Um, so it kind of illustrates just how some of these hazards are intersecting uh, our lives a little bit. Okay, let's see. Uh, so, just quickly, um, I'm going to introduce IGS and our hazards program, talk a little bit about the setting uh, here in Idaho for, for landslides. Um, I'm going to briefly discuss our landslide inventory database, which uh, is probably a topic that a lot of other state surveys are, are interested in or, or have dealt with. Um, I won't go into too, too much detail, but um, I can certainly answer more questions about that if there are any. Um, and then I'm just going to run through some of the notable landslide hotspots around the state uh, and then talk about some some what I consider sort of oddball um, slope stability issues uh, that we see around Idaho. Uh, so the, the Idaho Geological Survey is a state agency, but we're we're quite small. Uh, there's only about 15 uh, staff members. And so we're administered by the University of Idaho. So we're kind of somewhere between state government and, and academic. Um, we, uh, we do research, we collaborate with a lot of different people, we, we try to do as much outreach as we can, and uh, we're non-regulatory, so, um, so we're just providing data, we're not really setting any policy. All right, so let's talk about Idaho a little bit. Um, the, uh, the topography and climate and, and geology all contribute to um, the this the conditions for landslides here. Uh, Idaho is a is a very high relief state. There's a lot of mountains in Idaho. Um, I've heard people say that if you flattened out Idaho, uh, it would be as big as Texas. I, I've never actually tried to do that calculation, but um, I guess the point is that uh, there's a lot of mountains uh, and there's a lot of rivers cut in into those mountains, uh, creating steep uh, canyons, and that's really where all of our transportation corridors are. Um, there's not a lot of easy ways to get around certain parts of Idaho. 
Um, and that can be a big problem when a rock, a rock fall or a landslide shuts down uh, one of those highways. Um, we've got some unique um, structural and, and lithologic uh, conditions around the state that contribute to landslides. Uh, and the climate varies um, really drastically uh, across the state. Um, so, hey, hey, Stephen, I'm sorry. I just have a quick question. Um, it looks like these have all like all the animations and, and click throughs have already been advanced. Nope. Is there is there a way to reset that? You know, I honestly do not know. Um, OK, look at the three the three dots down the, in the bottom of the screen. Do you have that yep. like option to reset your presentation down there? No, um, I can stop presenting and then just start over again. You yeah, want me to try that? that. Yeah. OK, Sorry about that. Try okay. to nope. adopt new technology and we. Uh, no, nope. no problem. That uh, comes with the territory. Okay, so let me just try that one more time. Um, okay, am I going to have to do that all over again? I don't know. Uh, you try. shouldn't. You go ahead and try. Okay, file already exists. Yes. Uh, hmm. I recently shared this in Teams. Well, I'll just try uploading a copy, I guess. Sorry, yeah. everybody. Yeah, it's. It's uh, that's I guess the, that's uh, the problem with trying something new. Yeah, so the world we live in, and uh, yeah. Okay, well, it'll just take a second, but um, as we're waiting for that, I can I can just sort of describe that um, in the next slide. Um, I've got a, a precipitation map um, for the U.S. and uh, Idaho has a really um, steep gradient of of uh, precipitation from from north to south. In the north, we've got uh, basically temperate rainforest in some some parts of the panhandle and in the south we have uh, arid desert less than 10 uh, inches of rain per year so it's a, it's a really broad range of uh, precipitation conditions um, but we still see landslides across the entire area in, in dry places and wet places so uh, to me that's not really um, you know the, the the biggest control um, I would I would argue that uh, the lithologic conditions are are more important, um, and and in some cases the structural conditions. Okay, can you see my slides yeah. again? Yeah, it looks okay, great. Hopefully, right. sorry for working this time. Yeah, sorry for for that. Okay, look, those were those were supposed to come on at separate times. Accurate. Okay, um, all right. So here's our here's our precipitation map for for the U.S. averaged uh, over 1981 to 2010, and um, there's Idaho, and uh, it's got a it's got a pretty steep gradient, so um, we, we get almost the entire range of precipitation here in the state. Um, but uh, as I said, what I think is more important are um, some of the geologic conditions. So this is just a, a quick map that I produced um, of lacustrine sediments in Idaho, and I just extracted this from our state geologic map. So it's, it's fairly broad, but um, you can see there's a lot of different um, lacustrine deposits around the state. Some of these, most of these are, are Miocene in age, and uh, a lot of them are unconsolidated and, and pretty problematic for um, slope stability issues. Um, okay, so um, just briefly, I wanted to touch on the landslide database that we have for the state. It's, it's an inventory. We just completed it uh, this last year. It was a couple years in, in progress. It was funded by our state transportation department. And uh, it's now live as a, um, as a interactive web map. And we have a real broad mix of landslide data in there. Um, one of the main sources uh, for this map was a 1991 publication that the Idaho survey uh, put out which is just a static paper map. It doesn't have really good documentation, so it's hard to tell where all those points are from. So we took those, we added really just any uh, available uh, landslide mapping that we could find, compiled it in here. So we have points, we have polygons, and then more recently we've been getting LIDAR data in a lot of, uh, a lot of areas in Idaho, and we're using that to start mapping new landslides or, or basically fixing or, or revising the old mapping that we've got in there. So it's a work in progress. There's about 4,000 records in there right now. Um, some of those are duplicates between a, a point and a polygon. Uh, and a lot of them probably need to be updated, but we're getting there. 
uh, I guess one thing I do want to say about this is that it's a little bit biased. Um, a lot of the landslides mapped are along highways because that's where we can see them. Uh, and so I haven't really done any sort of density map or heat map with these data, but uh, I think it would probably end up just highlighting highways uh, at this point um, because a lot of it is just biased towards that. But hopefully with new LIDAR, we can expand that mapping a little bit. Okay, so I want to talk about some specific landslides that illustrate different uh, landslide conditions around the state. And so this, this first one is uh, what we just call the Elk City landslide. This one occurred along Highway 14, uh, which is a pretty minor highway in Idaho, but it's the only major road between, well, in and out of this town of Elk City. And um, as you'll see, that was kind of a problem. Um, okay, so this landslide is occurring essentially right on the um, right on the uphill slope of the uh, highway, and it, it's it's been going on for a while. Uh, it was first recognized at least um, at least in 2011, probably earlier. And um, you can see there's there's a, kind of a small failure there, but it came down onto the highway. Um, and then in 2016, uh, they were doing some cleanup work there, some, some crews uh, for the state transportation department. And they, um, one of the workers captured uh, a pretty big uh, failure on the slope. So let's take a quick look at that. Doesn't appear to be playing. Zach, is it playing on your side? If I hit the play button that I can get it to play. Okay. Just going to skip ahead a little until the action starts here. OK, so I saw some some chats uh, pop up. Was everybody able to actually see that? I saw some people say they had their own controls on the video. Yeah, it looks like uh, unfortunately, again, the new technology, I didn't realize this, that you can all hit play. So uh, oh, OK, yeah. All right. Well, hope, hopefully people saw that uh, it was a big landslide. And this photo here is a is a shot of the highway right after that failure. Um, and it completely blocked the highway for many months over the winter. So uh, that's a problem. Elk City is not a big town, but there, there are people living there year round. And uh, it was, you know, it essentially cut them off from, from the rest of the world. So, uh, so this was definitely a problematic landslide. And, but that wasn't the end of it. So that was in uh, early 2016. Um, and then a month later, you can see that the lands, that previous landslide uh, retrogressed a bit up um, the slope and is getting bigger. Uh, and, and so there was a big mitigation effort. Um, the transportation department uh, brought in a lot of different people to, to clean it up and, and try to stabilize it. And it was it was um, looking pretty stable and, and pretty clean at this point. This is uh, end of the summer 2016. Um, and then when I went back to visit in 2020, so uh, I think four years later after that last photo, you can see that uh, there's a, another failure starting on that slope. So this is a this is definitely a problematic area. 
it's not the only place within this canyon or along this highway that, that is causing problems. And one of the main problems here is that there's just a lot of um, there's there's a lot of uh, geologic structure that uh, is just unfavorable. There's a lot of foliation and uh, and metamorphic rock in here that um, in, in in the right orientation just um, fails easily. Okay, so another hot spot for landslides in the state is the Panhandle area, and this is one of those locations where we have a lot of unconsolidated lacustrine deposits. In this case, uh, glacial lacustrine uh, from the last glaciation. Uh, it's also really wet up there. Um, the modern uh, streams and rivers have incised pretty steeply into this thick layer of lacustrine deposits, so there's pretty steep little mini gorges. Uh, and um, there's a lot of uh, train, um, there's a lot of train traffic uh, on, on several rail lines here. So, um, so there's a lot of potential for issues here. And uh, we've, we, we had a pilot project to do some mapping up there. Um, we did a little bit, we worked with some collaborators to do some, uh, some drone LIDAR mapping. Um, so uh, I'll show you some of those results here. Um, this area has been on people's radar for a while. This was a landslide in 1998 that took out uh, Highway 95. Uh, so this is really the main north-south highway uh, through most of the state. Um, and there was, uh, I believe, I believe this was triggered by some construction work. Uh, there's a really good case study of this landslide in Derek Cornforth's uh, textbook on landslides, but um, I believe this was triggered by some construction activity. The, the soil essentially just liquefied um, and flowed, uh, took out the highway, took out a railroad, and um, required a, a pretty major reroute of this highway through here. Um, so, so we know there have been problems up here for a while. Um, not far from that last picture um, in 2017, there was uh, a landslide that uh, took out uh, a railroad track and caused this derailment um, of a train. Fortunately, this was just grain being carried by this train, but um, there are a lot of um, a lot of trains transporting oil and other hazardous materials through this area. So, uh, so there's definitely potential for some issues. Um, and more recently, uh, in early 2020, one of those trains derailed. Uh, and fortunately, this one I don't think was carrying any hazardous material, or, or if it if it was, it wasn't involved in the actual derailment. But the engines uh, derailed here, and and in this this part of the canyon, this is on the Kootenai River. There's not a lot of glacial lacustrine deposits, but you can see behind the train here, there's a there's a dip slope, and so the the structure of the geology here is um, contributing to to a lot of failures. And there are a couple of spots along this railroad that seem to just always have rockfall. Um, so that last derailment, if, if you're ever curious how you get a train out of a river, um, turns out that they use really big airbags. I thought that was kind of a kind of a cool um, project. I wasn't there, but I uh, found some neat information about that. Um, so this pilot project that the Geological Survey worked on, uh, we worked with uh, colleagues at Idaho State University to, to basically find a few sample locations where we could fly a drone with a LIDAR uh, sensor and collect some data. It's, it's uh, really heavily forested up here, so LIDAR is really the, one of the only ways you can actually see uh, what's happening on the ground. Um, so this is my colleague Donna from ISU flying her drone and LIDAR instrument. And we collected um, a couple of, I think we did three sites. I'll show you a couple examples here, but this is just the highest return. So uh, you can see it's, it's pretty forested. Uh, but after we filter that out, you can see um, we get a pretty nice digital elevation model. So uh, the, um, this landslide and derailment that you see here occurred uh, right in this scalloped section above the river. And then another site we visited, um, uh, we were able to, to see kind of a progression of, of what looked like younger uh, landslides 
moving towards the right here. And you can see from this uh, drone photo that 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 last one to the right is just above uh, railroad track. OK, so I got another video. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody wants to chime in on how to do this better, but um, I'm just going to hit play. Or, and I guess if, if you can go ahead and hit play now. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and, and move on. But um, uh, that was a, a you know pretty uh, nice example of the glacial custard sediment failing. It's, it's pretty unconsolidated, pretty um, soft, and you can see that it kind of just slid out across the highway there. That this particular spot has had issues. Again, this was the um, state transportation department doing some cleanup on the road when this happened. So uh, so we know that it's a it's a problem area. Uh, this is that same site, um, probably about a year after uh, the video. Um, and um, we had just uh, gotten a couple of drones uh, for the survey at that time. So I, I took a couple of um, aerial photos and then uh, built a, um, a 3D model using structure from motion. And so this photo, the, the exposure is not very good, um, but that's okay because you know, just looking at it quickly, it, it looks like the slope is is fairly clean. Um, you know, you can see some uh, some efforts to to kind of um, direct some of the water off the surface. It looks like there's some drains in there. Um, and I made a uh, a 3D model with structure from motion. Uh, let's see. Again, this this is going to be a little video. It's not YouTube, but it's just uh, I don't know if you guys can see this on your own or if you're seeing my screen, but uh, it's just a fly around of the of the 3D model. Um, and the uh, the drone has been super helpful for for this kind of work, uh, especially at small sites. Um, many of you may also use your own for this kind of thing, but uh, it's it's really quick. It's really helpful, and um, you can uh, produce um, some pretty decent digital elevation models like this. So this is this is the digital elevation model from that uh, model I just showed you, and you can see that um, you know here's the slope that's been cleaned up. Uh, and at the time, there were um, some new failures uh, starting to form here. Um, so uh, a nice tool for um, for repeat measurements or monitoring. Um, and I haven't been back to the site in a while, so I don't know what it looks like right now. OK, so uh, moving on to another hot spot uh, here in the Boise foothills. I'm, I'm located in Boise. And just outside of town here, we have uh, a really great um, foothills area. There's a lot of trails and uh, good mountain biking and hiking. And it's um, it's growing quite a bit in terms of um, house development. So a lot of developers are building homes up there. Um, and that's all uh, up, up to a certain uh, elevation. It's pretty much all uh, pretty thick deposits of Miocene Lake Idaho sediments. So there's a, a huge lake covering southwest Idaho in, in the Miocene dropped a lot of sediment and um, and it's it's variably unconsolidated to to pretty well cemented um, and it, it varies over pretty short distances but there are some parts of the Boise foothills that are really problematic uh, because they have uh, layers of, of clay rich um, sediment that that are pretty um, prone to, to failure and so uh, it's kind of a recipe for um, a bad situation which which did happen a couple of years ago here um, so there was a small housing development called Terra Nativa, which was built, I think it was only about um, six or eight homes. And um, this, uh, this shot here kind of shows um, the outline of, of the landslide. This is just a Google Earth uh, capture. Um, but you can see the boundary of the landslide cut through <laughs> several of the houses directly. Um, and it was, uh, it was a pretty huge disaster. So um, you can see part of the scarf here. Uh, those, are, those are my colleagues, Bill and Virginia, uh, gawking at this along with me. Um, 
the, the whole, you know, it's not a big neighborhood, but this entire stretch of road was just completely destroyed. All the houses were ultimately destroyed. Um, this this one, it looks like the house was put in a blender or something. It's um, it's it's pretty spectacular. Um, the the scarp cuts, you know, directly through several of the houses and driveways. Um, this house, the, the scarp goes right in front of the, the front door of this house, but you can see that a lot of the windows and doors are uh, are now parallelograms uh, because uh, the whole thing is just tilting. And, and these weren't cheap homes. Um, let's see, here we go. You can see you can see the outline of the, the uh, landslide there kind of coming out <laughs> through the middle of this house. Um, here's another view uh, where I kind of trace out the, uh, the boundary there. Um, and here, here's a pretty big fissure near the head scarp. So this made a lot of news locally in town. Um, and and I, I grabbed just a couple of headlines here. Um, homes deemed dangerous, uh, owners prepare for legal battle. Um, uh, uh, landslide reduces assessed value by $18 million. Um, city is tearing down crumbling homes. And, uh, and I guess the, the conclusion is that uh, this group of homeowners sued a number of uh, entities and um, and they settled with all of them. So um, not a great experience for, for anybody. Um, and I imagine that these kinds of things will happen more frequently um, as, as more homes uh, get built up there. But a uh, pretty spectacular example. Okay, another um, hot spot or, or hot spots um, that we see a lot of landslide problems with here in the state are along Highway 95 and State Highway 55. And so the two of those highways connect and, and that's really the only in-state route that you can take from north to south in, in Idaho. Um, if, you, if that road is closed, you either have to go through Montana or through Washington to get uh, to the northern part of the state. And so, um, so there's a few sections of these highways that are seem to be always um, causing problems. Um, a short section on Highway 95 called Landslide Alley. Um, a lot of people refer to it um, between the towns of Pollock and Lucille. And then uh, the the section the um, section to the south is on Highway 55 um, along the uh, North Fork of the Payette River, which is a pretty narrow canyon. And so um, there's several examples of uh, really disruptive landslides that have happened there. Here's a Google Earth view of, of part of that landslide alley. The river and the highway run right through the bottom of the canyon. You can, you can sort of see that uh, just sort of some suspect um, landslidey terrain here. Um, we've more recently gotten LIDAR along most of this corridor, and you can see some um, in some places, what looks like maybe just um, shallow creep, but then in other places you have, you know, really distinct head scarps and failures and, and flow features. So, um, and the, the geology here, this is this is sort of in the what we call the uh, Western Idaho shear zone, and there's a lot of metamorphosed rock that contains chlorite and talc and, and serpentinite. So it's pretty slippery and um, that seems to be a contributing factor in, in a lot of these um, failures. Uh, here is a, an abandoned section of the highway that um, I don't know exactly when this was abandoned, but they moved the highway to the other side of the river and, uh, and this section is still there and uh, you can see it's pretty beat up. Okay, another video. Um, I would say go ahead and just hit play if you can't see my play. Okay, yeah, so this was the result of that um, really amazing video that somebody captured while they were driving by. Uh, this is uh, south of the town of Riggins, um, and uh, there's a, it was a pretty big rock fall. You can see um, there's some pretty unfavorable uh, joints in this uh, rock face. And this happened, I think, uh, July 3rd, maybe. Um, so there's a, a pretty big pile of debris on the road. 
um, the state started, uh, the state transportation department started cleaning it up. Um, and then um, there was a second uh, pretty sizable rock fall that kind of um, set them back a little bit. And so they, uh, they did a, a lot of cleanup work. They did some blasting and I think put in uh, maybe some mesh, some bolts. Uh, it was it was a pretty big deal, um, but they've got it cleaned up now. It looks pretty stable, uh, but that was a, a huge disruption to, to travel in the state because, as I said, Highway 95 is, is really the, the main link north to south, and it was also over a holiday weekend, Fourth uh, of July weekend. Uh, so yeah, these kinds of um, these kinds of rock falls and, and road closures are, are really problematic. And I just saw somebody say something about how amazing it is to capture all these on video. And uh, Stephen and I were just talking about that before um, the talk. And yeah, they're, we're really fortunate that everybody's got a, a camera in their phone right now because uh, there's a lot of really good landslide videos. OK, um, another um, hot spot for landslides that is uh, associated with that Lake Idaho uh, sediment um, is a little further to the uh, east in uh, what I call the Snake River Canyon. And uh, again, this is this is the same Miocene age uh, Lake Idaho that deposited a lot of sediment. Um, in this particular canyon, there's a really well-known fossil bed there, uh, the Hagerman fossil bed, um, same deposit. And um, really kind of the same story as, as uh, some of the other stuff we've seen. Um, there's a, a Google Earth oblique view that it's a little hard to see uh, without having some 3D motion on it. So I have a video here that, um, that shows it a little better. But uh, this is near the town of Bliss. And this landslide, um, I think, is a reactivation of a, of a much older landslide. But this happened in 1993. You can see the road uh, got pretty well buckled. There's There were a few houses on or near this uh, main deposit. And uh, the landslide pushed down into the river. And I think this rapid where the river or where the uh, landslide impinges on the river is, is pretty persistent. So I think this is a, a kind of a long-term active landslide. Um, but this 1993 event was, was a big movement all at once. Um, and I've got, okay, I'm just gonna try this again. Again, with your video, go ahead and hit play if you if you can't see this. Um, this maybe will give you a little bit better idea of, of what the structure looks like. It's, it's beautifully preserving a lot of flow structures. Um, it's pretty young and it's pretty dry. So you can see a lot of the hummocks and um, all sorts of other flow structures really clearly. Okay, so just down the river from there, um, uh, there was a, a what what started off, uh, or I guess what got on our radar as a fire. Turns out it was a landslide that caused a fire, uh, and and it just sort of cascaded into a bunch of other hazards. But you can see the head scarp opened up here. Um, this is some basalt, and there's a bunch of this. Uh, Miocene sediment sort of sitting in, in the uh, in the wall of the canyon here. And um, it was, I think, a rotational failure that toppled some power lines and then caused a fire. But uh, that's not all. There's there's actually more to it. There, It's right above a dam structure on the Snake River. So um, so it was there was like a triple whammy of potential um, potential hazards there. Uh, you can see the, the the soot on the ground after the fire, and um, this I took this photo because you can see the path of some of these rocks that rolled down the slope, um, and and uh, it was kind of surprising how far some of these went. Okay, all right, and and now there's just a mishmash of kind of miscellaneous landslides that uh, maybe didn't necessarily have uh, any theme to them, but um, uh, were interesting, I think, uh, to point out. And so, you know, these these might occur in basalt, uh, in glaciated uh, granitic uh, settings. Um, we have some older lake sediments uh, in eastern Idaho, and and some a really spectacular landslide in in uh, Paleozoic limestone. So we kind of have a whole range of different 
geologic settings. And uh, one thing I realized after I put this together is I, I really don't even talk about um, debris flows very much here, but uh, we, the debris flows are pretty common in central Idaho where we have um, highly weathered um, Idaho baffle with granite. Uh, that stuff turns to grass. Um, it's often um, recently burned by a wildfire. And so uh, there's a lot of ingredients for debris flows. And, and I, I don't really touch on those here, but that's also definitely uh, an issue in some parts of the state. Um, okay, so back to the that cover photo. This is a just a what I think is a is a really textbook example of a landslide. This is near Horseshoe Bend. Um, that highway there is Highway 55, which which we've talked about already. Um, and you can't really see this too well from the road. Um, and um, I posted a photo of this on Twitter um, at some point, and there were a lot of questions about what kind of deposit this is. And, whether it's um, you know human-made fill, I actually don't really know. Um, I think there might be some Lake Idaho deposits in this area, and, and there's certainly a lot of other landslide issues uh, in this um, in this drainage and, and along this road. Um, but this particular pile of dirt, I don't really know much about. So uh, I'd be curious to hear if anybody has any um, insight on that. But that's to me, that's just a, a great photo. Um, in eastern Idaho, near the town of Salmon, uh, we have some older lake deposits. These are tertiary, but with the same results. We have uh, the Salmon River flowing, um, I guess, towards the right side of the screen here. Uh, and these steep banks um, are undercut, uh, and you get these, these pretty large failures here. So you can see uh, pretty clearly the headscarp. And this is just outside the town. You can see there's, there's some of the town uh, in the background of salmon. Um, here's a, just a, a neat little uh, landslide failure in a basalt road cut. Um, I was driving around and, and uh, thought this was kind of a, a neat example that we don't really see a lot of landslides or, or failures like this in basalt. Usually it's some sort of topple, but uh, this is a pretty neat one. Um, this is a Google Earth image because I, I couldn't really fly a drone high enough to, to capture this, but uh, this is right along the border of Idaho and Wyoming. So in Google Earth, you can see the border overlaying here. So it actually kind of crosses the border, but um, this is just above Palisades Reservoir. And I, I believe this is um, some, some kind of uh, massive rock um, avalanche. Uh, yeah, so, so John got just just said it's a blowout canyon. That's correct. Um, uh, so there, there was some sort of huge failure um, near the top of the slope or, or the top of the uh, ridge here, and it seems to have uh, flowed all the way down and, and made it pretty much all the way down to just about the highway and the reservoir. Um, but it's a really neat hike. Uh, I think I might have. Yeah, here's here's the best I could do with the drone. Um, you can kind of see some some flow structures in there. It's it's basically just all this um, broken up, very angular uh, limestone, mostly, I think. Um, that's, this, this location is pretty close to the Teton Fault. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about seismically triggered uh, landslides later in the talk. But um, I, I don't really know if there's been any connection made to any uh, earthquakes. But uh, as I as I talk about later, I think it's pretty um, it's a pretty tough connection to make just because of the uncertainties uh, in in dating. So I don't really know, and I, I don't want to speculate. But it's it's in a tectonically active area, so um, so it, it it's definitely an interesting possibility. Okay, uh, this is another big one that I don't have a good real photo of. So this is a Google Earth uh, capture, but uh, this is Carlson Lake landslide. So Carlson Lake is up here, and there is just this incredible, uh, what looks like really kind of a, a flow that came out of the canyon here, and, and it's it's this really nice hourglass shape. Um, there are a bunch of small lakes and ponds throughout um, this entire uh, deposit, and uh, some some work has been done by um, a grad student at Idaho State University a few years back, uh, dating the sediments in in or, or sediment cores from some of these ponds, 
And uh, I think the age of this is somewhere between maybe seven and 9,000 years old. Um, so it's pretty recent. Um, and I think there's actually some, some younger dates along the toe, but I don't know um, what those mean exactly. Um, but anyway, this, this one is just a, a really amazing um, example of, of, of a landslide. And this is all in um, basically Paleozoic limestone terrain. So uh, just in the background, you can't quite see the top, but I think this is Bora Peak, so the highest, highest point in Idaho. And this is this is the east side of the Lost River Range, which is um, which is all just Paleozoic limestone uh, for the most part. Maybe some some other um, some other quartzite or something in there as well, but um, uh, not not uh, typically considered a weak rock. Okay. All right. So. Uh, yeah, so we'll, we can talk a little bit about seismically, seismically triggered landslides. Um, as I mentioned, you know, as, as far as those ancient events go, it's hard to correlate. Um, you know, when you date an earthquake, you have a pretty big uncertainty. When you date a landslide, you have a pretty big uncertainty. So, um, you know, it's hard to, hard to really definitively connect those. But we have had some historical events that we can connect um, because we, we were there. And um, those include the Hebgen Lake earthquake, uh, which is which is just outside Idaho uh, in Montana in the Yellowstone region, uh, the Bora Peak earthquake, and then more recently the Stanley earthquake from just uh, two years ago. Uh, so the Hebgen Lake um, triggered a, a massive failure. Uh, I believe this was so, uh, I believe it was some sort of dip slope um, or or some structural uh, structurally controlled failure, but, you know, this huge um, mountainside failed, crossed the valley, and, and basically created this dam and, and formed this new lake, which they call Earthquake Lake or Quake Lake. Uh, it's still there. You can drive right up and over this. There's a, there's a really nice uh, interpretive center here. Um, unfortunately, it killed a number of people uh, in a campground that was essentially underneath this, this mass. And, um, but you know, this this is a, a pretty clear example of, uh, of seismically triggered failure. Here's another view of that uh, same dam from downstream. <clears throat> um, in 1983, the Bora Peak earthquake, uh, which is a magnitude 6.9, um, created a spectacular fault scarp, but there were also a, a few, um, I guess, slope failure or rockfall um, issues uh, that it triggered, and and I, you know, I was able to find this um, newspaper photo from the town of Chalice, which is pretty close to the epicenter, and uh, it's a pretty scary close call with this boulder, um, basically on somebody's front porch. Um, but there were some other uh, smaller landslides that occurred, essentially along the fault scarp. I don't have photos of them in, in this uh, presentation, but there are a couple other small ones. Um, and then uh, two years ago, it, during the Stanley earthquake, um, which was a magnitude 6.5, that occurred in the in well, it was the end of March, but there was really um, heavy or, or deep snowpack at the time. Um, that triggered a lot of snow avalanches, which I guess we might expect. Um, but we also found that there's, you know, in addition to just the snow, it seems like there was a lot of um, you know, rock fall or, or dirt and rock debris mixed in with the snow, um, which is kind of interesting. I, I don't know if that's a common um, occurrence, but, um, you know, it's it was pretty widespread and, and a lot of them were fairly small, so we didn't really go out and map all of these, but, um, you know, you can see on the left image here, uh, this is Highway 21 in Idaho, which um, at the time was actually closed because of high avalanche risk before the earthquake even happened. So fortunately the road was, was uh, nobody was on the road, but a number of these um, small um, av snow avalanche and, and debris avalanche um, uh, events um, came down and blocked the road. And then on the right side, uh, this is a, a small snow avalanche that actually blocked the I don't know if this is the middle fork of the Salmon River technically, or if it's one of its tributaries, but 
Um, we saw a few of these blocking rivers, and, and we even saw that signal in some of the stream gauges, um, a short-lived drop and then, uh, and then a rebound. So uh, that was an interesting effect. And I say these are small, but on the ground, um, there was a pretty decent amount of snow that, that came down and, and covered these roads. So it wasn't, um, it wasn't trivial to get these cleaned up. And closer to the epicenter um, of, of this earthquake, the Stanley earthquake, we didn't find any evidence of ground rupture from the fault itself. But there was, sometime later after the earthquake, there was uh, a few reports of a beach that went missing in one of the lakes. So there's a small lake called Stanley Lake, uh, which, is, which is really almost right on the fault scarp. And um, it was frozen over at the time. There's a lot of snow on the ground. But we got some reports of um, something weird happening there, some kind of ground subsidence or, or fault rupture or something. Um, so when we went to check it out, it turns out it wasn't fault rupture, but uh, it was uh, what we think was uh, liquefaction and lateral spreading. And uh, this is my boss, Claudio, our, uh, our state geologist, standing along uh, one of these um, fissures that opened up uh, near the shore of uh, Stanley Lake. And uh, here's an aerial view of the shoreline. So this is this is fairly shallow water here, but you can see uh, there's some really um, clearly defined fissures and fractures parallel to the um, shoreline. And what happened here, we think, is that um, there was there was basically a small sand delta that had formed here um, at the inlet stream of uh, into this lake. Uh, it was a pretty popular recreation area, a nice sandy spot where you could uh, camp out and have a picnic. And people started um, sending in reports that it was gone. And um, at the time, the lake was frozen over, but you can see from this aerial photograph, there was uh, a lot of fractures in the ice uh, suggesting you know, something happened here. And we think that the lateral spreading essentially just slid that delta uh, down into the into the deeper part of the lake, um, and so another video. I apologize. Go ahead and hit hit start if you if you can't see this. But here's a an animation of uh, satellite photos, and you can see. Uh, let's watch that one more time. From start to finish, you you essentially lose that bright uh, sandy delta, uh, and. Um, and a lot of this region along the shoreline uh, actually uh, subsided, and, and it's it's a lot marshier than it used to be. Um, we uh, we tried to tried to get some bathymetric surveying done right after this happened, um, but we weren't able to secure the funding to do it. So um, I don't know if it's too late to do that now, but it would be really interesting to see what that deposit looks like um, underwater um, because. There are other lakes along the Sawtooth Fault that have been cored, and uh, this is this is mostly work uh, by Glenn Thackeray and some of his colleagues at Idaho State University. Uh, but they've identified seismic events in in those lake cores, and I'd be really curious to know if an event like this would leave enough of a signal on the on the floor of the lake to to be um, you know preserved in in future uh, geologic record. Um, so. Interesting topic. We uh, we just didn't really have the money or or resources to tackle that um, at the time. Okay, and so the last topic. Um, this is this is one of the oddball um, topics that I mentioned earlier. Are sakong, and um, I don't know a lot about these. Uh, certainly didn't see really any of them until we started looking at lidar, new lidar in central Idaho, and um, you know what this lidar is showing really is that a, a pretty big area in central Idaho has been glaciated, and, and probably it was some sort of um, alpine ice cap. I think um, it, it really covered almost the entire central part of the state, and uh, there's lots of incredible, uh, you know, glacial scour and moraines and, and all sorts of uh, really nice glacial features. But in in almost all these areas where we have 
these, uh, which has now been deglaciated, uh, we find a lot of secum, which are, um, you know, I, I guess my understanding are they're some kind of gravity driven, um, uh, usually uphill facing scarps. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I, again, I don't know a lot about them, so there may be some different categories or, or different definitions for these things, but um, they're really spectacular when you look at them in LIDAR because, you know, I, I often am looking around for fault scarps, especially in, near uh, Stanley, near the Sawtooth Fault, and these things really jump out. Um, I just, I found this slide when I was putting this together, some hand-drawn map um, from an old slide deck, and I, I like this because it shows some of the glacial ice extent from the last glaciation, but you can see it's it's really sporadic. It's probably just a few mountain ranges or or uh, isolated locations. But I think that for the most part, a lot of this area was just um, covered uh, continuously. So um, that's another topic, but uh, it seems to be kind of important for this uh, Sakung story. So here's just uh, the last three slides are just um, some examples of what we what we are interpreting as SACUM in uh, some of the new LIDAR. And uh, you can see um, usually there's there's quite a few um, together in the same place. You rarely just see one. But uh, you can see uh, the illumination areas highlighting these uphill facing scarps along this ridge. This is near the, this is in the Sawtooth Mountains. Um, here's another one. This is a, this is a slope map. Um, so it's illuminated a little, a little differently, but you can see a number of these um, basically slope parallel features that um, appear to be uphill facing. And then here's uh, another example. This one is also from the Sawtooth, um, and this is again a, a slope map. Um, but you can see a, a really interesting geometric pattern here, and, and I, I can assure you th these aren't just logging roads. I mean, sometimes you see um, you know, switchbacks or something like that. But this is just uh, this is just wilderness. There's no roads there, um, so there's there's some really interesting um, features there that I, I guess I would categorize as as slope failures or, or gravity driven um, features. Uh, I don't really know what to make of these. Um, I am interested in in maybe doing a little more systematic mapping of these. Um, and, and maybe some patterns would come out of that, but um, right now it's, it's sort of just a curiosity and uh, something that uh, needs a little more exploration. Um, but that's it. I kind of, I blazed through a lot of slides there, but I think I'm done in time. So um, I would love to uh, take some questions if you have any.